one is a protein that we discovered some years ago with a number of different functions, and I'm going to focus today on cancer in general and breast cancer in particular. We found that BP1 is an isoform of the DLX4 gene. At the time we discovered BP1, and I cloned and sequenced it, um, we found that there was a sequence homology with other forms that were already in the literature. One group had called their DNA sequence DLX7, the other had called theirs DLX4, and they didn't recognize that they were related to each other, but when we cloned BP1, and that's a historical name, it stands for beta protein 1, and I discovered it in the context of sickle cell anemia, which is a whole other topic, but um, it is a repressor, a naturally occurring repressor of the human beta globin gene, and it's important in normal hematopoiesis, so that's one of its normal functions. And so I, when, we, uh, when I cloned and we sequenced this, we found that it, it wasn't just sequence homology, the sequences were identical between nucleotide 565 on BP1 and 1251, compared with DLX7 and DLX4 as far as it had been sequenced. So the light line is DNA, the heavy line is the proposed open reading frame, and HB stands for homeobox. And so these encode transcription factors that bind to DNA and regulate genes. And I'm bringing this up because there's a confusion in the literature between BP1 and DLX4. Some people are using those terms interchangeably, and they're not. They are different. So if you ever decide to look at one of these, you have to make sure if you look up a paper what they really looked at. But, but I'm very careful about calling this BP1, obviously, but the DLX4 is another story. So homeobox genes are master regulator genes that encode transcription factors. They're important in early development. They exhibit a conserved 180 base pair DNA sequence, highly conserved. And there are different classes. The first class that was discovered and looked at was called Hox. And so you may have heard of those proteins. There are 39 members of class one. And class two examples include Pax, MSX, PBX, and Distalis. BP1 belongs to the Distalis family. And this is determined by the sequence of the homeobox. DLX genes are highly conserved. They're found in frogs, Drosophila, zebrafish, chickens, mice, and humans. And their functions are highly conserved throughout evolution as well. They're important for craniofacial, tooth, ocular, and limb <laughs> development in mice. So they have a very important normal functions in development. We found that BP1 is activated in cancer. Oops, I think I skipped one here. Let's go back. <coughs> it's activated in 80% of breast cancers, 70% <coughs> of prostate cancers, we, we found, and also 63% of acute myeloid leukemias. Other groups have found it in ovarian cancer, about 65% of those uh, cases were BP1 positive. About 45% of lung cancers are BP1 positive. These are non-small cell lung cancers. And from an array that we looked at, about 40% of those looked like they were positive. And this is just what's been looked at. So if you're interested in a particular different kind of cancer, it is very possible that it would be positive. We're focused on breast cancer in my lab. The, uh, BP1 RNA is activated in 80% of breast cancers. And this was our first publication on BP1. It was an RNA study. We found association between BP1 mRNA and clinical pathological data. We found with, with regard to the estrogen receptor, 100% of estrogen receptor negative tumors were BP1 positive. And those are the more aggressive tumors. 
whereas 73% of the ER positive tumors were also BP1 positive. With PR progesterone receptor, 96% of those PR negative cases were BP1 positive and 67% of the PR positive cases. Now, in what is, I think, a very important aspect of this, BP1 is activated in 89% of the tumors of African American women. And it's known that African American women have a particularly aggressive breast cancer. They have a uh, shorter survival time and their cancer is more aggressive. This is an overview of genes known to be involved in breast cancer. HER2 is a well-known oncogene, and it's expressed in 20 to 30 percent of breast cancers. CMIC, 20 to 30 percent. Cyclin E, 30 percent. EGFR, 25 to 35 percent. Cyclin D1, 50 percent, of which 20 percent are amplified. And our number of 80 percent for BP1, and uh, in collaboration with a group at Georgetown, uh, Lucien Cavalli, by FISH, we discovered that BP1 is amplified in about 30% of cases. But that still leaves an awful lot of cases that aren't accounted for by amplification. In one study, we looked at BP1 and breast cancer progression. Breast cancer progression is believed to, after starting with a normal breast cell uh, tissue, turns, can develop into hyperplasia, then ductal carcinoma in situ, and then invasive ductal breast cancer. By immunostaining, uh, my collaborator found that BP1 is uh, cells, none of those cases that were looked at were BP1 positive, where the definition of a positive was that 4% or more of the cells in a tumor had, or in, in the cells had to stain positive for BP1. And we didn't find any among the ones that were stained. In hyperplasia, 21% of the cases were BP1 positive, 46% of ductal carcinoma in situ, and then 81%. So this is protein. And the data before was RNA, so that was 80%. So these numbers are identical for all practical purposes. This is some of the immunostaining. So this is a normal breast from the normal reduction mammoplasties. And BP1 positive ducts would be red. So in this case, there are no red BP1 positive cells. Hyperplasia, this is a BP1 positive duct, and this is a BP1 negative duct. So they're very clearly distinguishable. In DCIS, in this particular duct is mixed, BP1 positive, BP1 negative, all in the same duct. And here, in invasive ductal cancer, we see a normal duct here, it's blue, with BP1 positive cells here, which have escaped from a duct. So in summary of that data and other data in the paper, as tumor progression occurs, there's an increase in the percentage of BP1 positive tumors. The percentage of BP1 positive tumors, cells per tumor, increases. And BP1 staining intensity increases, and we take that as a measure of BP1 expression. Now I'm going to turn to another kind of breast cancer, which you may not be so familiar with, called inflammatory breast cancer. That's a rapidly progressive breast cancer, highly angiogenic and invasive. The five-year survival is less than 45 percent compared with 86 percent in non-IBC. Less than half of the patients have a discrete mass. So it's not often picked up by mammography. And the patient presents with what looks like an inflammation on the skin of the breast. 
So when they go to the doctor with that, it's often misdiagnosed as an infection. And so first the patient is treated for an infection and it doesn't clear up and then after some testing, further testing, the doctor finds out the patient has breast cancer. And by that time, since this is a very aggressive breast cancer, often it has metastasized. So it's a, a very nasty cancer. Um, it represents one to five percent of all breast cancers in Caucasians and 10 percent in African Americans. So we had the opportunity to look at BP1 in inflammatory breast cancer because there was a repository on our campus. It's very hard to find these repositories because there are so few cases. 100 percent of the IBC tumors that were looked at by immunostaining were BP1 positive. We had 45 cases with 95 percent of the cells positive in the case, in each case. There were nine patients who had metastasis and so we had uh, access to nine paired metastatic lymph nodes and all were BP1 positive. This was our first indication that BP1 may be involved in metastasis. Tumor cells in blood vessels and lymphatic channels were BP1 positive, and I'll show you that. You can see I collaborated with some great pathologists here. So BP1 expression in lymphatic channels and blood vessels shown here. These are the lymphatic channels. So here's a channel. These red, bright red cells are all BP1 positive. And likewise here and here. In blood vessels also, BP1 positive cells. So we come to the molecular question. I am a molecular biologist. What genes does BP1 activate? So this is a list of some of the ones we found. It activates MMP9, which is important in initiation, invasion, and metastasis. BCL2, which is an anti-apoptotic gene. And so when BP1's overexpressed in BCL2, those cells become resistant to cell death uh, and cell death by TNF alpha in particular. CMYK, it's upregulating these genes, all these genes. Um, which is, I know you're familiar <coughs> with, it's associated with proliferation, differentiation, and apoptosis, MET, growth, angiogenesis, and metastasis, and VEGF, which is very important in angiogenesis. And I'm sure there are others as well. So not surprisingly, I have come to the conclusion that BP1 expression is associated with aggressiveness. And so I'm going to show you some of that data now. The measurements of aggressiveness that we used and looked at are growth in the absence of serum. So there's more growth in the absence of serum in cells that have higher BP1. Growth in soft agar or uh, anchorage independent growth invasion through matrigel, and changes in tumor formation in nude mice. So we're limited in time. I'm only going to talk about some of the experiments with the mice. We created MCF7 cells overexpressing BP1. They were injected into the fat pads of nude mice. Now you might know that MCF7 cells, in order to form tumors, um, when injected into the fat pads of nude mice, the mice have to be supplemented with estrogen. So here we looked at the effect of BP1 on tumor growth in mice using three cell lines derived from MCF, MCF7. Empty vector is the blue. The red is one of the overexpressing cell lines that we put in on a plasmid. And BP1-4 is the second independent isolate. So if we looked at tumor formation over 58 days and tumor size measured with the calipers, we found that the cells overexpressing BP1, the BP1-2 and 4, are larger than the tumors with uh, the empty vector. And these mice were all supplemented with estrogen.
Not surprisingly, BP1 mRNA levels are associated with larger tumors in women. Normally, I guess you may start with women, but we went from the mice to the women and found something very similar. This is a BP1 RNA level, relative levels. This is the tumor tissue, um, 31 cases here, in, uh, with respect to BP1 RNA. And this is normal tissue, which all clustered very, uh, the RNA clustered very low. So that was uh, statistically significantly different. Pro the proliferation rates are higher in BP1 positive breast tumors than in normal cells. And this can be measured by staining with a marker called KI67, it's a proliferation marker. So the pathologist takes the tissue and first stains with BP1 and then secondarily stains with KI67. <coughs> And so he knows or she knows which cells are BP1 positive and which cells stain or don't stain for KI67. And so this experiment was done and BP1, 5,000 BP1 positive cells were examined under the microscope and 360 of those stained also for KI67. That's 7.2%. 5,000 BP1 negative cells were looked at and only 170 of those stained positive for KI67, which is 3.4%, and those are statistically significantly different. So the conclusion was that the proliferation rates are higher in BP1 positive breast tumors. And this is just an aside. We had, uh, and others had created, two other cell lines overexpressing BP1, HS578T and T47D cells, and cells that overexpressed BP1 showed higher proliferation rates. So it was consistent. Now, I mentioned to you about the estrogen requirement for tumor formation. And uh, these experiments were done uh, in collaboration with Dr. Barbara Vanderhaar at the NCI. So she and her lab injected MCF7 cells containing the empty vector, which I mentioned to you, and estrogen was added to the mice. 40% of the mice developed tumors with, an empty, with the empty vector, but the mice overexpressing BP1 in the presence of estrogen made more tumors, 67% in the O2 cell line and 64% in the O4 cell line. Oh, I, sorry, I have to go back and show you something. Now, the particularly interesting part here is in the absence of estrogen, no mice form tumors with the empty vector, which is expected, but 20% of the mice were able to form tumors in the absence of added estrogen in the O2 cell line and the O4 cell line, both. That suggests that BP1 may be regulating the estrogen receptor. And it does, both directly and indirectly. We showed that BP1 protein binds to the first intervening sequence of ER alpha DNA. And we showed this by CHIP, uh, chromatin aminoprecipitation. So these are the positive controls, these are the negative controls. And the two cell lines, the empty vector and the O2 cell line, when the protein DNA uh, is immunoprecipitated and then examined, we saw that when there's more BP1 protein, there's more of the IVS1 DNA that immunoprecipitates. By Western blot, this is V1 and V2. There's more BP1 protein. It's about twice as much. It's not a huge dramatic difference, but it's enough to make a difference. ER alpha is certainly increased uh, protein. And then PS2, which is a, a direct target of ER alpha and shows that the ER alpha is functional, there's more, ER, there's more PS2 protein in O2 cells 
than in B1 cells, and that's the beta actin control. BP1 also indirectly regulates ER alpha. It stabilizes the protein by upregulating a gene called P300. And P300 is known to acetylate and stabilize the ER alpha protein. So this is RNA, B1 uh, and O1 cell lines. And this is P300. So there's more P300 RNA in the cell line overexpressing BP1 than in the empty vector containing cell line. And by Western blot in V1 compared with O1, there's more protein as well, P300 protein. Also indirectly, BP1 and BRCA1 are involved. So BRCA1 inhibits ER alpha protein by ubiquitinating it. And so it's set up for degradation. But we've already published uh, with another group that BP1 represses BRCA1 by binding to its first intron, which is predicted to further increase the level of ER alpha. So if you draw all this together into one model, it's a little more clear. BP1 acts as a classical transcription factor. It binds to ER alpha DNA and transcriptionally upregulates it. It binds and upregulates P300. P300 acetylates and stabilizes ER alpha protein, giving more protein. BRCA1 by itself ubiquitinates ER alpha protein, which is then degraded, not all of it, some of it. And BP1 is known to repress BRCA1. Therefore, there would be less ubiquitination and less degradation. So altogether, these three pathways, direct and two indirect, result in more ER alpha protein. And so you might predict that these cells could be more resistant to tamoxifen, which in fact they are. So that paper has been submitted now. Now I could draw a number of conclusions from these studies. Uh, but the one I wanted to talk about for a moment is the idea of BP1 as a potential therapeutic target. <coughs> and this isn't really so straightforward. Um, we tried to make some stable cell lines using SI RNA against BP1. Um, which we, made, we had them on plasma, put them into cells, measured the amount of pro BP1 protein. And so we saw reductions of protein, as we hoped we would, anywhere from about, from nothing to like 10%, 20%, on down to 80%. So we were really interested in the 80% level of reduction and what effects that would have in this um, breast cancer cell. It was MDA, MD231 cells we were using. And we we're growing up the cells, which we always do when we make new stable cell lines, we we're growing them to freeze them, to save them. And the ones with the 80% reduction died. We couldn't grow them. They, they, they just died. <laughs> and uh, so that was lethal. And of course, there are other ways to do it, like using an inducible promoter, things like that, or an inducible SI. Um, but the point of this is that there is something called oncogene addiction, where cells can become addicted to a particular oncogenic protein, and they will die in the absence of it. This could be a case of that. Well, that's encouraging for the idea of knocking out BP1. But on the other hand, as I mentioned, BP1 is an important protein for hematopoiesis. We know that. We know it's expressed in normal kidney, and so it has presumably a function there, which could be part of its um, hematopoiesis um, program, because that's the location of the erythropoietin gene. Now, because it's a homeobot gene and homeotic protein, it's going to be involved in early development. 
So if you totally knocked out BP1, I think you would have some very big problems, certainly with a pregnant woman who had a developing fetus, but with hematopoiesis for sure, and maybe other functions as well. So that's where we are now, and uh, I am open for ideas for, we can try turning down BP1 without knocking it out. That's gonna be a little tricky, uh, but that may be what we certainly will have to try to do in the laboratory to see what effect that would have, because certainly BP1 seems to be a very powerful protein involved in aggressive breast cancer. And then you could go on to hypothesize too that uh, it could be useful in, perhaps in treating prostate cancer and some of the other cancers that were listed on that slide. It's not just involved in breast cancer. I want to thank my collaborators here um, at George Washington, uh, <coughs> Dr. Sidney Fu, who's been a collaborator, and then uh, this student in my lab, Saurabh Karilakar, did a lot of the work that I just showed you on the paper that's been submitted. It was very nice work. San Katawati was another student, um, and current students in the lab. Dr. Arnie Schwartz, who's a pathologist who participated in the immunostaining. Uh, Dr. Paul Levine, who has the inflammatory breast cancer repository. Dr. Sam Simmons, our biostatistician at the NCI. Uh, Barbara Vonderhaar, as I mentioned, who subsequently has now left and retired, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and at Hopkins, we're collaborating with a the group there on something else. And then uh, Yan Gao Man, who also did the immunostaining. Those pictures were from Yan Gao. Uh, he was at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology at that point and Dr. Joe Pinzon at the David Geffen School of Medicine. Thank you. <laughs> Question? Yes, so uh, it's very comprehensive uh, study. So uh, uh, my point, uh, question is, okay, so you have found that about 90% of the breast cancers have uh, BP1, 8% uh, positive, right? Well, uh, you know, you say uh, the ER positive ratio is around 20%. Well, right. among the ER negatives, 100% of those were positive. But still right, in total, you know, breast cancers. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. so 20%. So if you say the main target for BP1 is ER, then, you know, it may not be the case, right? So the ER ratio should be much higher in breast cancer, right? Well, firstly, ER is one of the targets, but um, not the only target. I just focused on it here. I listed some of the other targets that are known for BP1. Would you repeat your question? So uh, if ER is the, uh, the main target for BP1, I would expect, you know, the ratio for BP1 positive and ER positive cells in breast cancer should be similar, right? The ratio of what? For BP1 positive cells and in uh, you know ER positive breast cancer should be similar. Well, that's not its only function. ER is not its only target. It's not the on no. only target. It may have others. Yeah, maybe you can do a Chrome TMP to find the mo you know, a lot of others. Do you have any other candidates? Well, um, yeah. Well, I think we should make on that slide. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and other well known options. Right, right, right. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Oh, any more questions? Thank you.